you took measurements, um, for instance, let me show you the, 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 the picture I want to show you to begin with, which is um, of the quail um, cage. First of all, I'll show you exhibit number 20, which is Worley, page 7, if you could put that up on the screen. You recognize that? I do. And what is that? It's one of the diagrams that I created. And what's it a diagram of? That quail cage. Okay. Now, you did a okay that sketch and that sketch shows so it says defect interior side of cage in defect interior side wall of cage and defect interior back wall of cage, right? Right. So you have an entrance and an exit hole, correct? That's right. Now, what did you try, what did you do to try to determine the trajectory on that? Where did it come from? We placed a flight path rod um, through defect J uh, all the way through to where it went through the back, of, back wall of the cage. Okay, and let me see, I know I have a picture of that. Is that a picture of that rod? It's one of the many pictures, yes. No, but I mean, does it's, that picture accurately depict the rod you put through, but from the in exterior to the interior? Yes. Okay. How about put that up, please? It would be uh, 2019. So you're telling the jury that this is a rod that you ran from that, the, from the entrance hole to the exit hole, and what are you doing right here? That's where we're determining the angle. Um, Upward or downward angle. That's right. Okay. Now let's talk about how you determined the angle of front to back. I don't know what you call that scientifically. I mean, did you determine the angle of that rod? as to the exterior wall of that? Yes. Okay. And um, the, based on the exhibit we saw a moment ago, the entrance wound would have been on the, how about go back to Worley page seven. The entrance would have been on this side, correct? Yes. Now, the, uh, the feed room, you would agree with me, is not on that side of the uh, quail cage, correct? That's right. Matter of fact, th this side faces the feed room, correct? I believe so, yes. Now, did you ter determine, and I can walk through all the technical things you did, but did you only determine the angle, you can check your notes, the angle of the entrance hole over here to that side. That is, at what is the, is that horizontal? Am I talking horizontal? Yes. Okay, the horizontal um, entrance and exit wound, if you put that rod through it, what did it tell you about the angle as opposed to that flat area? Uh, we determined it was approximately 41 degrees. 41 degrees. And if I'm standing at that edge, is it 41 degrees to my right or my left? Uh, I believe to the right. I'm not sure, though. Can you look and see? I don't have that in my notes. OK, 
Okay, let me show you a picture. It's worth a thousand words. Just help refresh your memory? Yes. And so, um, let me, could you put uh, KNWL2019 up, please? Okay, what you did was, correct me if I'm wrong, you put that rod through, and then you put a protractor up against it, and then the protractor told you it was 41 degrees from flat, from flat, or... From, from the, where the uh, bullet went in the wall, from that flat edge to where the angle is, was 41 degrees. Okay, and let me show you... KNWL2007. Ask a question, see if it comes up. You don't strike that, I don't need it. I don't need, well, that's it. But that depicts that rod you put from the exterior through the interior, right? That's right. And so as that rod sticks out, it would be the path of the bullet. Approximately, yes. Approximately, okay. And it's 41 degrees from neutral. Yes. Or, I mean, it'd be, if this were the wall of the, um, the, the wall the bullet went into, it would be, 41 degrees would be over here. Yes. Right. So that side, right. Okay, and so, and I see from that picture we showed a moment ago, used a protractor, just like this one, maybe similar to this one, to determine that angle, right? That's right. And basically you just um, put, you take the rod and then you put this up to it and then figure out what the angle is, right? You line up the middle of the protractor on, on where the defect is, yes. Where the defect, where the bullet hole is. Right. Okay. Now, did you do the same thing for the dog pen? A doghouse. Yes, we did. And let me walk you through a couple of those pictures. Let me see if I have. Okay. Let's go to page six of eight of her report. Is that something you prepared? It is. Okay. So if we look at this, could you zoom in just a little bit for me, please? And here we go. So defect one is the entrance hole. It's defect I, yes. I'm sorry? Defect I. Okay. And defect H is what? It we weren't sure if it was a, a defect. It didn't it didn't go through the wall, but we marked it. Did you have anything that went all the way through? Just I. Just I. Um, but you also stuck a rod in that, correct? Yes, we did. And what was the, and the, and the dog, uh, this side of the um, doghouse would be the side facing the kennels? Yes. Okay. And what was the angle, entrance angle on that? You put a rod through and measured, just like you did before, um, with a protractor. And what was the, um, the angle on that? The horizontal angle was approximately 84 degrees. So 84 degrees. Now the side the bullet went in was facing the dog pens. Yes. And as we see from the photos, approximately, I mean, again, I'm just some guesswork, but not square with the dog pens, a little bit further to, if you're standing uh, in the feed room, if you're looking at the dog, house, um, it would be a little bit to your left, correct? That's right. And then this trajectory into the doghouse is 84 degrees, which means it's coming, if that's 
the the uh, the uh, feed room, it's coming from even further over here, correct? Yes. Okay. So let me have you do this for me. You, if I if I had a sketch, your sketch of the doghouse and the quail cage, you could take that protractor right there and basically show the line out, correct? From the quail cage to the doghouse? No, from the quail cage, the trajectory, if I put down <coughs> that protractor on the side where the bullet went in, that's pretty easy to identify in your sketch. Right. And went to, what was the first one, how many degrees? I'm sorry, I can't remember it either. Was uh, 41 degrees. 41 degrees? 41 degrees um, on your sketch. Uh, you could follow the trajectory of that bullet out, correct? Yes. You could do the same thing on the doghouse. Dog right. Okay. Wait one second. All right, let's uh, slip in a commercial break here. We'll get you back for more live testimony out of South Carolina. Alec Murdoch on trial right after this. Stay with us. Bobguilt.com today. Welcome back to our continuing coverage of the state of South Carolina versus Alec Murdoch. We've been watching day three of testimony unfold this morning. 54-year-old Alec Murdoch faces four charges, two counts of murder for the 2021 shooting deaths of his 52-year-old wife, Maggie, and 22-year-old son, Paul. If convicted, he could receive a sentence of 30 years to life in prison. Let's go back onto the uh, back into the courtroom. Uh, while we're at break, they set up an easel. Dick Harputian is still cross-examining SLED senior criminalist Melinda Worthy. No. It would have been up if you follow that out. Are you familiar with where that um, grape vine was? If you're looking at the feed room all the way to the right? Mm -hmm. Well, it was, I think a little bit further up than that. But even maybe beyond that, one of the shots fired by that AR blackout was fired from somewhere way up here, correct? I mean, that's the trajectory. Does it mean? I can't tell you the distance it was from, from the animal cage to wherever. I can't tell you where the shooter was within that line. But that line is way away from the, from the, from the right? Right. And this one, while it's closer, is still many feet away from the, um, the feed door. Yes. So as you saw this area right here that night, you assumed, I think, not assumed, but everyone's sort of concluded that it was a really close shot into the feed room that killed Paul, correct? Two shots. I believe so. Okay. Now, the AR, um, at least this line would indicate the AR was some distance away from the feed room when those two shots were fired, correct? I can. Yes. Okay. Now, you recovered these projectiles. Did, were they tested for blood or tissue? So that you can determine whether they pass through Maggie or just the misses. Some of them to the lab. You don't know whether they tested them or not. I told you they didn't test them. Would that surprise you? No. Okay. Now, does this lead you to believe, and you're someone that processes crime scenes, I mean, if this had been sketched out the night of the, of the um, I mean, you didn't take these measurements until a month later. I took these measurements on scene the night of. Oh, so you had these measurements. Right. You, but did you know the degrees? No, that was not Until July 12th. But on July 12th, did anyone go back out and walk <coughs> this line to see if maybe there's shell casings way up here? No one looked up there, correct? Not what I'm wondering. Okay, and no one did a topographical study to indicate if you follow these lines back, whether the, wherever a shooter could have been were higher or lower uh, than um, the doghouse or the the um, small animal cage, right? Right. But doesn't this indicate to you there were two shooters? There was a shooter up here and a shooter down here? Is it a possibility? Well, let me say this. Is it a possibility that there are two shooters based on the data you collected? I, it just indicated it was, there was movement between. Movement 
from here all the way up to here? I don't know that it went all the way up there. But is it, is it, I'm not telling you. I mean, one, one explanation would be movement, correct? Yes. One explanation would be, would be two shooters. I'm sorry? Yes? I wasn't there. Well, no, no, no. But one explanation of this data would be two shooters. <coughs> one explanation. Not the, but one. Not the only one. Yeah, not the only one. But it is a reasonable explanation, just like one shooter running up that way, correct? Sure. So a re one of the reasonable explanations is there are two people there. There are two guns there. One's a shotgun, one's an AR. And we now see that that AR is being shot from way up here, correct? I can't see that though. It's somewhere along that line. And that line goes a dozen, two dozen, three dozen yards from the feed room, if you follow straight up. I don't know where they were within that line. Could someone have been a lookout there? They went there to kill Paul, and and uh, that's the lookout. Maggie surprised him. They thought she was gone. Have no idea. Reasonable though, right? Right? I know you weren't there, but none of us were there. We're trying to figure out what happened that night. And clearly, one reasonable explanation is two shooters. One explanation. One. Right. And a number of them. I'd like to offer this to evidence. Yeah, it's not to scale. Talk to the court. I'm sorry. Your Honor, I'm offering this in Let's get a break in here while uh, we have a little delay in the courtroom. Get you back for more live testimony right after this. Stay with us. The life of Alec Murdoch is bizarre. It is complicated. This great South Carolina attorney is charged with the murders of his own wife and son. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Who exactly is this guy? The evidence is going to show that he was there. He is innocent. Who knows where this thing is going to end? This case needs to be resolved. We need to put this behind us and move on. Murdoch Family Murders. Live coverage today, only on Court TV. We are in South Carolina this morning as the Murdoch Family Murders trial enters day three of testimony. Disgraced lawyer Alec Murdoch facing a jury of four, including two counts of murder for the alleged execution-style shooting deaths of his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul. It's going to be up to a jury to decide his fate. There he is in the courtroom. He's been emotional over uh, these three, four days of testimony at times. Let's go back in. Still on the stand is Melinda Worthy. She's the sled criminalist. Dick Harputhian is cross-examining her. That they did not come from the feed room, or right. the vicinity of the feed room, and they're literally yards away from the feed room, correct? Yes. Okay, I'm not going to beat that, of course, anymore. So let's talk a little bit about footprints, okay? Okay. So I noticed in your report, correct me if I'm wrong, that you were unable to identify either exclude or include a number of different footprints in and around the feed room, bloody footprints, um, and other footprints um, because of the quality of the photography. Is that correct? I was able to attribute them to Paul's shoes. I'm sorry? I was able to attribute them to Paul's shoes, though. Well, we'll talk about Paul's shoes in just a minute. Mm -hmm. But when you, uh, what's the process to take a photograph of footwear or imprint um, that's recognized 
by a number of different agencies, including the FBI. What's that process? Place a scale, and preferably an L scale, uh, around the impression and document it with the camera parallel to the surface so you get a straight on shot. Um, put it in the camera in raw setting so you capture all the data with that photograph. So let me ask you, so the process is, first of all, you take a general pho photograph of the impression, right? It's yes. A, it doesn't matter what angle, doesn't matter what the lighting is at that point, correct? If you're just documenting you're just that documenting. it's there. But when you go to take a photograph of a footprint for forensic analysis later on to compare it to a known shoe, um, you're supposed to do a couple things. Um, one, you're supposed to have good lighting if you can get it, right? Perfectly. Two, you're supposed to put a scale down next to it so that later on you can, I mean, because you need to understand how big or how small um, the foot is and the distance between the treads. So the scale is a little, um, like a little ruler, just a piece of a ruler that you put down next to it to get some idea whether what an inch looks like what two inches look like. And that's really important, is it not? It is, to make sure it's to scale. Okay. And then you're supposed to do a photograph straight down on it, with again, with good lighting, um, so that you can have a, you understand what you're seeing is a straight-on impression, correct? That's right. Now, was that done on any, any of the impressions that y'all analyzed? No. We didn't recognize on scene. I'm sorry? We didn't recognize on scene that there was footwear. You didn't recognize on scene there was what? Footwear impressions in the, in the room. Well, that brings up another topic. Um, there was a, what appeared to, may have been, a footwear impression on Maggie's calf, correct? I couldn't say that that was a footwear impression, just an impression. Well, there was something on her leg that could have been a footwear impression, correct? Possibly. Possibly. And again, they didn't put a scale, they didn't do any of this procedure, correct? That's right. And it was in dirt. Yes. So, or mud, one. And so, once her body was removed from the scene, that examination could never be done, correct? That's right. As a matter of fact, none of the impressions could be examined after um, the next day at best, correct? Not physically. Right. I mean, yeah. you couldn't go back out and take new photographs. Right. So the procedures followed were not the procedures recommended by every agency and in your agency, correct? If, if I had realized that was footwear on scene, I would have documented it properly, yes. Okay. But since it wasn't documented properly, we can't include or exclude, except for Paul's, correct? That's right. Now, are you a uh, certified footwear examiner? Um, yes. By who? Well, within SLED, yes. I'm sorry? Within SLED. Within SLED, but you not peer-reviewed or... Oh, yes, I am peer-reviewed. By somebody at SLED? Every, yes. Okay. And your analysis is that one set of those um, footwear impressions is Paul facing the back of the uh, feed room, right? Right. And yet, we know, and they're bloody, so he's already been shot. Right. And we know he, the initial shot came buckshot, very small pattern, in his chest, and came out underneath his left arm. Matter of fact, it was wadding under his left arm, and buckshot went through the back window and embedded in the windowsill. You documented that, right? Right. And then I think some of it embedded in a tree back behind that window, correct? I think, yes. And he's facing backwards, bloody footprints. Has anyone discussed with you how he got faced away from where he was shot? No. Were the footprints smudged as if he was turning? And there was blood uh, dripping. He was stepping in the blood and leaving his own footwear impressions in the blood. I don't, I don't know that it was smeared necessarily. Well, we also know that a second shot, um, literally his head exploded, his brain flew out, 
may have, we know there's hair and blood all over that door up high. There's actually hair and blood and pieces of his skull in the ceiling and around him, um, assuming the first shot would not have been immediately fatal because it didn't hit any, any critical organs. He would have been alive for some period of time after that shotgun blast to the, to the chest. Um, but the second shot, as you've seen in the pictures, and you were there that night, wasn't his brain laying at his feet? It was beside his left leg, yes. I'm sorry? It was beside his left leg, yes. Yeah. And he's, his feet are just, one of them is just inside the feed room and the other's not. Yes. And he's face down. Right. So you can't explain how he got shot in the front when he's at some point soon thereafter facing backwards. I can't say which way he was facing when he was actually shot. The, the second shot, he was right there at the door. And I can tell you that. So he got from facing the back door after he was shot, I mean the back window, to facing forward for the second shot. Is that right? Right. Has anyone from SLED briefed you on after you identified those footprints? No. They didn't ask for any explanation? Not for me, no. Okay, and you would agree that because of the way the scene was processed, that most of the footprints you were unable to do any comparison to because of the way the pictures were? No, I was able to do a comparison with, and they were mostly Paul's shoes. Other than those two? There was one right inside the door. There was one further to the left where the door was. Um, then there were at least two by marker one. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, at least one of those bloody footprints initially identified as Paul's turned out to be a police officer, isn't that correct? Not, it wasn't initially identified as Paul's, no. But there was a bloody footprint near his that turned out to be law enforcement, correct? Yes. In the feed room. Right. In blood. Is that preservation of the scene that your that your standards require? Not not exactly, no. Not exactly? Should the police be walking through the scene? No. Do we know what other evidence? Top of the hour approaches the defendant getting uh, emotional at times this morning, talking about the death of his son. We'll get a break in here. Want to thank Ken Williams. More live testimony out of South Carolina next. Welcome back to Court TV Live. The murders of Maggie and Paul Murdoch rocked the small 75-person town of Isleton, South Carolina, back in June of 2021. But the person prosecutors say did it would be even more of a shock to the tight-knit community. The family's patriarch, then prominent attorney Alec Murdoch, would be charged with their murders. As a whole slew of other bizarre and shocking twists about the family would start to come to light as well. Let's go back into the courtroom now. We've been watching testimony. It's the second week of testimony in this case. All day long, it's been SLED senior criminalist Melinda Worthy on the stand and the cross-examination by Dick Harputian. I'm gonna point to the jury where that impression is on her leg. This whole area right here. And it has, if you blow it up, you can see some regular lines as opposed to irregular, right? Yes. yes. Which would indicate um, some, not natural, but when I say unnatural, man-made <clears throat> something caused that, correct? There's a distinct pattern to it. Okay. Now, <clears throat> were you able to, why were you not able to get significant definition to compare it to a footwear? I felt like I had enough definition, I just couldn't attribute it to any type of footwear. Any type of footwear? As far as any type of shoe, um, I wasn't able to attribute it to a specific type of shoe. Okay, now, and you would agree with me, there's no scale. Right. There's no multiple pictures of this from different angles for the purpose of giving you the more definition so you could make a comparison, correct? There's not. Um, so this was not done according to procedure? I mean, I didn't know about this on scene. Yeah, but as, as your photographers take pictures, um, aren't they, I mean, wouldn't it be good just to put down a scale, no matter what? 
if I if I had seen that, we would have. But I mean, somebody had. A lot of these photographs are taken without you present, correct? No, I was there. You were there for that photograph. Yes. And did you notice the mud on her foot? Okay. No. But as you look at it now, you agree that a better photograph taken under the procedures of SWED and the FBI and everybody else could have given uh, you a, a better ability to match it to a piece of footwear, correct? I don't, I don't know that a better photograph would have given me better results. I, I think I saw enough of it to know I wasn't going to be able to attribute it to a type of footwear. Without a straight on shot, without a scale, without all the things recommended. I couldn't. I couldn't even say it was a footwear impression. I just called it a based, impression. But based on that, based on that photograph, yes, which is not a photograph done to compare footwear. It, not ideal. No. Not ideal. It's not. There's no. The standards say that is not within the standards. Correct. Objection. Argumentative. Can you answer the question? Go ahead. Is you understand what the question is? Uh, the question is. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Did you understand the question? Yes. What's the answer? It would be better to take the photograph properly with the scale. But you would concede this was not taken pursuant to that. And what you're saying is no one appreciated the fact that it was a footwear or could be a footwear impression that night. So no one treated it like a piece of footwear. Right. But we know that same night they didn't treat any suspected footwear according to procedures, correct? No scale, no multiple pictures, no 90 degree, right? Right. Okay, thank you. Go ahead and take the stand. Did um, you participate in processing um, Alex's T-shirt, shorts, and shoes? The T-shirt and shorts, yes. Okay. And what did you do with that? As far as the LCD? Yeah. Um, we documented the entire process from start to finish, with the starting with the packaging that the shirt was in. Um, took the shirt out of the package, photographed it front and back, inside and out to show how it was before we did anything to it. Uh, then we hung it up and applied the LCV, which is a liquid spray. Um, any stains that we saw after using the spray, uh, we documented those with photographs without scale, and then we just photoed with the, with the scale. Uh, then we laid the shirt flat and photographed each of those stains on the shirt. It was stains A through H on the front and stains I and J on the back. Uh, we labeled those A through H, I and J uh, with scale and photographed each one of them um, before we did anything else. Let me show you a couple photographs. Any objections? No objections. Can you identify these, please? Dog 19A, please. Yes. Yes. Is that the shirt as you saw it that night? Not that night, no. When, when did you see it? When we processed it at when? the lab. Okay. So you would agree with me that this shirt has it doesn't look like it just came back from the laundry. It's got smudges down here and generally stains here and there, correct? It's not completely clean. Yeah, okay. Well, that's it. It's not completely clean, correct? Right. And then I'd offer that into evidence, Your Honor. 31. Tell me. What this is, please. Uh, after we had sprayed the shirt with LCV, we laid it in a grid to account for uh, where on the shirt each stain was. 
And there seems to be something on the bottom that looks like a handprint, does it not? Uh, I didn't see a handprint. That was uh, on the body cam footage where he was wiping his face with the shirt right there. Offer this in Can I have uh, that 19? I'm sorry. Let me see what it is. What, what does it say at the bottom? Uh, KNM 32A2. Okay, and we agree that you did this with LCV, right? That's a what they call a presumptive test. It could be human blood. It could also be animal blood. It also could be detergent. Objection, Your Honor. Could we ask one question at a time? I was trying to summary, um, but I'll do it. Okay. Could it be something other than which it, it, it something other than human blood? It doesn't. It doesn't determine whether it's human or not. Right. So it could be animal blood. It's possible. Could be detergent. Detergent, oftentimes. Uh, not uh, bleach, maybe. Bleach. Okay. Um, what about uh, organic matter like plants? The only two I know of really is bleach and rust. That rust. Right. Okay. But there are other things that will build, and that's why you do a confirmatory test. Right. And that's done with hematrace. I'm not sure how. I don't do that part. So. Well, do you know what the results were when they treated it with hematrace? Uh, I'm not sure, no. You never saw the report? No. No human blood found? Hey, now, did you test the shorts? We did, we did the same procedure with the shorts. And, and yes. there, there some presumptive, I mean, some indication that it was human blood or something else, correct? Yes. Um, do you know whether they ran a confirmatory test on that? I'm not I assume they did. I'm did sure. you? Did, well, but you don't know. Right. Do you know whether, did you use LCV on the shorts or did you use something else? We used LCV. Okay. Did you do the shoes? No. 